a major meeting of the Chinese Communist Party, and a stunning change that could spell disaster for China. Welcome to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. China just held a yearly meeting of top communist officials called the Two Sessions. Ah, the Two Sessions, a horribly boring bureaucratic black box where Western China analysts stretch themselves to find the hidden meaning behind even the most mundane things like what did it mean that she had two cups of hot tea in front of him instead of one? Which, by the time it reaches the worst of YouTube China experts, becomes China will collapse in 28 days, which will sadly perform better than anything on China Uncensored. But whatever, I care about you, the people who watch, which is why I sift through an incredibly boring bureaucratic meeting to deliver important nuggets of truth to you. Because I can say in just the first two days of the meeting, earth-shaking changes to China were made, and they hid it in incredibly boring work reports and droning speeches. I suffer for you. So first, it's important to understand the context for the two sessions this year. About a month ago, China's stock market crashed, losing $7 trillion, yes, trillion dollars in value. The real estate crisis continued to spiral out of control. Developers are being forced to liquidate. Real estate made up a third of China's GDP and used to be considered the only safe place China's now dwindling middle class could invest their money. But there's pressure on the Chinese economy without as well as within. Exports are falling as countries around the world begin moving their supply chains out of China. And several countries launch anti-dumping probes. In other words, this is a bad time for Xi Jinping and the party. There is also growing unrest inside China, and the resentment is being directed at Xi and the party itself. So the two sessions were a chance for China to reassure the world with economic reforms and a friendlier diplomatic stance. Instead, the party did none of that, and they're cracking down harder. And Xi Jinping is only strengthening his iron grip on China. Here are some major takeaways from the two sessions. There has been a three-decade-long tradition of wrapping up the two sessions with a press conference with China's premier. But apparently they decided that state-run media throwing softball questions at a top government official was a little too much freedom of the press. So it's been scrapped. According to the South China Morning Post, these press conferences were one of the rare occasions when a top Chinese leader takes questions from local and international media. Those questions are often tightly scripted and chosen in advance, but it offers the outside world a chance to hear directly from a high-ranking official on policy directions. And some actually interesting things came out of them, because there was always the chance the premier might say something, even in that setting, he shouldn't have. Like the 2022 sessions, where then-premier Li Keqiang said 600 million people in China make less than $140 a month. I bet Xi Jinping wasn't too happy with that. Of course, Li Keqiang is dead now. There wasn't anything suspicious about it. So instead of the press conference, the two sessions will release incredibly engaging work reports, and they will be publicized so that the media and the public can learn about their content easily. Just the kind of reform people were craving. Yes, I want to read a boring, dense work report with no actual information instead of hearing from my leaders directly. But this is also a really significant change for another reason. Let me explain a bit about the system in China. You have the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government. Those are technically two separate things. And the party is the one that holds the real power. Most of the time, there'll be a lot of overlap. For example, Xi Jinping is the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, as well as the president of the government. Li Qiang, China's current premier, a government role, is also on the party's Politburo Standing Committee, which makes up the seven most powerful men in the Communist Party. Xi is sidelining Li Qiang by taking away his press conference. Not only that, on March 4th, State-run media released a list of officials presiding over the second session of the 14th National People's Congress. Now, usually, all members of the Politburo Standing Committee are on that list. Not this year. Li Qiang and his vice premier, Ding Xuexiang, were not on that list. In fact, all top officials in the state council system were not on that list. 
This is Xi and the party establishing themselves over the state. The party is gradually doing away with the illusion of having a government. Here's another big piece of that. According to State Run People's Daily, at the two sessions, they made changes to the organic law of the state council. Yes, that's the kind of boring thing I parse through for you. Because it's actually really significant. It says the state council, remember the part of the government Xi Jinping is sidelining in favor of his own power as Communist Party head. It said the state council is to uphold the leadership of the Communist Party of China, follow the guidance of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. According to the NPC Observer, this article, among other things, entrenches the party's leadership over the state council. And according to Sino Insider, this was done to essentially reduce the state council to an administrative office of the Xi leadership. Li Qiang is now the equivalent of Xi's chief secretary or office manager. The premier no longer has greater latitude to pursue his agenda for the economy unlike his predecessors. Talk about a demotion. But Xi's ambition is greater than just strengthening the party. He wants to ensure he's top dog. What Xi is doing is destroying what was called collective leadership in the party. Let me explain what that is. After Mao died and the chaos and purges of the Cultural Revolution were over, the guy who ultimately rose to power, Deng Xiaoping, pushed collective leadership, rehabilitating many of those Mao purged, which also made him pretty popular in the party. That's how he became the paramount leader, despite never being general secretary of the Communist Party. Plus, the party used collective leadership to rebrand itself as a democracy. Believe it or not, a lot of people in the West bought it, took it as a sign the Communist Party was reforming. The next guy in charge, Jiang Zemin, who I'm sure you recognize if you've been watching the show, used collective leadership to consolidate his power. He launched a massive countrywide genocide of Falun Gong, allowing him to build a massive state security apparatus and promote people who were eager to help him murder a bunch of people who meditated. So when the next guy came to power, Hu Jintao, Jiang was able to expand the Politburo Standing Committee to nine members, seven of which were his allies, and they used their collective leadership to stymie Hu Jintao. That might have happened to Xi Jinping too, if it weren't for the fact that Xi began working around the collective leadership by setting up various small groups and committees that he was directly in charge of. That's how he became known as the chairman of everything. That gave him the power to begin a massive purge of people in the Jiang faction. And she could start shifting away from collective leadership of the party to core leadership of the party. And Xi Jinping is that core. But remember at the beginning how I talked about all the problems China was facing as the two sessions began. Xi probably feels the best way to tackle them is by having more and more personal control. But that will only make the rest of the world more paranoid that Xi is becoming a dictator, that there is less room for a free market in China, that there will be less transparency, that China is closing itself off, not opening up. And without foreign investment driving China's economy, things are only going to continue to spiral. This kind of look into the black box of Chinese Communist Party politics is why they hate me. Chinese state media even called China Uncensored disgraceful anti-China garbage, which I put on a t-shirt that you can buy at chinauncensored.tv slash merchandise. But because Google is a big fan of the Chinese Communist Party, YouTube suppresses the show. And I can't afford to keep making China Uncensored. Paying my staff and keeping the lights on isn't cheap. The CCP would love it if I had to shut down the show. That's why I need your help. All it takes is a dollar or more an episode on patreon.com slash China Uncensored. I make about 16 episodes a month, but if that's too much for you, you can set a monthly limit. So you could ensure I keep uncensoring China for even a dollar a month. And as a thank you to everyone who gives on Patreon, I'll answer one of your questions at the end of these episodes. Today's question comes from 6T76T. I asked this a couple of days ago. With women opting out of marriage and kids more than ever, especially in China, how long till the CCP will go from pleading women to marry with benefits to full-on Handmaid's Tale, Romania, where they forced women to get pregnant? Likely more than one at a time. 
Great question, 6076T. That is your real name. Despite China reversing the one-child policy to now allowing three kids, birth rates have continued to fall. Some are predicting that by the end of the century, China's population will drop to just around half billion. And in government propaganda, they're blaming the women. Many Chinese women are choosing to stay single. So right now, the government is trying to incentivize people to have kids. Local governments and companies are offering cash incentives. Some cities are helping with fertility treatments. That's not working. So how long until they start forcing births? That may sound crazy, but keep in mind, there was a time when there were birth quotas the other way. You couldn't have more kids. Forced abortions and sterilizations were common. In 1991, two counties in Shandong province had a campaign called 100 Days No Births. Women were rounded up for forced abortions or induction of labor. One local official claims that these procedures were sometimes no more than a kick in the stomach from an out-of-town mercenary. Children who did make it into the world were reportedly strangled and their bodies tossed into open pits. The families of pregnant women were publicly shamed in reprises of the Cultural Revolution. So how far off is The Handmaid's Tale in China? I'd say it's pretty darn close. Thanks for your question and your support, 6076T. Be like 6076T and hit that orange button to support this show on Patreon. Make the CCP mad again. And you can also support me by checking out my new show, Deep Thoughts While Gaming, where I talk about controversial topics by hiding them in gaming content. This week, I'm talking about the border crisis. In Skyrim, that is. Definitely not talking about real-world events, YouTube. Check it out and let me know what you think. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.